Hey guys, Henning and Morden from Flip Normals here. And in today's video, we're going to talk about Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> and more specifically, how to level up, not in Pokemon, but in real life and, you know, your artistic skills. But we're going to use Pokemon as an analogy because we just had a talk about this just before starting. It's like how to best explain this to people. Originally, we were going to talk about, okay, how do, you, how do you get to level two as an artist? But level two still sounds kind of shitty. Yeah. Like you're still... You're still, you know, just starting out. So we 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 extended it to Pokemon levels instead, and uh, so that's, we're gonna go from there. Essentially, you know, when you start out in Pokemon, you're we let's assume you're level one. You're not. You're like level five, whatever. When you start with like, you know, Bulbasaur or Charmander or Squirtle or whatever, but let's assume it's level one. And the first time you meet a Rattata in the grass, you're like it's fifty fifty. Mm. You know, sometimes you beat it, sometimes you don't. And uh, in the beginning, because you're such at a, such a low level, it's hard to perceive sort of the intricacies of a Pokemon battle or the intricacies of doing art. For example, if you're sculpting or if you're doing texturing, in the beginning you might just start to replicate what you see in start of understanding why you do the things you do. You don't you don't use fundamentals because you don't have any fundamentals yet so we're sort of skipping that level and going up to the people who are like maybe level 30 in pokemon and uh, they've got a pretty good grasp on software and you know they've got their technical skills are definitely down they know how to use whatever tool they need if it's maya blender zbrush uh, substance mori um, but you're trying to get to that next level that level 70 where you can beat the Indigo League, you can, we just looked at it, you can like capture Rayquaza or whatever, and you're not gonna have too many issues. Um, that's the level, that's the next level for you. Like you can reliably beat every single trainer without too much effort. Yeah, exactly. And like, so you wanna, you know, you wanna be, you don't wanna be Ash, because Ash, he sucks. <laughs> I can't express how much I actually hate Ash in Pokemon. He's such a, he's such a bitch. <laughs> like, Ash in Pokemon is probably one of my least favorite characters in history mm, probably because he's 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 so weak and he never ages he never ages either but like he all he also doesn't ever really win yeah he's like as just like the perfect re representation of a mediocre pokemon trainer mm. um you don't want to be that no you want to be red you know red he is badass and he just he he is the he's the man he's the king so you want to be like red don't be like ash mm. and uh you know, don't be like Misty or Brock either. No one cares about them. <laughs> I'm probably getting like a little sidetracked here. But, <laughs> but we have a point here, trust us. We're trying to get to level 70. Yeah. Essentially. Um, and you are now at level 30. Yeah. Like you, you're a decent artist yeah. at this point. And you've, you've beaten a few gyms and, you know, you know your way around a few Pokemon. And you at this point, you just probably, you probably have started to grasp the intricacies of weaknesses against different Pokemon. But you still might be brute forcing it. Yeah. You still might against a fire Pokemon. You might still be using water, which is just insanely overpowered. Yeah. You just happen to have like Hydro Pump or something and you find yeah. like a, I don't know, like a little Charmander. So it's, 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 it's not as elegant as it could be uh, because you still haven't gotten to the point where it's, how do you say? Like, it doesn't feel natural yet. No. There are still things that you need to consider every time you do a Pokemon battle or every time you do a sculpt or every time you do texturing. And getting to that next level is super hard. But as anyone who's ever played Pokemon knows, uh, it's about the grind, you know? There's always, <laughs> there's different ways of doing the grind. There's uh, stupid ways, like me, where I would just <laughs> walk around and, uh, you know, in the pitchy grass. Yeah, that's me. For hours as well. You go like, okay, first time I, I fight Brock, I'm like level 20, and I've just beaten all the pitches and all the Rattatas. You know, but that's and you a, decimate him. <laughs> but that's because you're just alone in the grass, and you don't seek advice from anyone. Whereas if you'd ask someone for help, uh, you could have speed, you could have sped that up quite a lot, mm. you know. Then then they would introduce you to Pokemon weaknesses, or in case of software, which software to use or how to use it better. But getting to that next level is really the tricky part because a lot of the a lot of artists I think often get to the sort of 60, 70 percent mark, but they have a hard time. You know, this maybe after a few years, like two or three years of doing doing 3D or doing art, and you're at a decent level. But you're always struggling to, you know, you look at your competition or you look at art station or whatever it is, and you always fall short just a little bit. It's like, oh, there's always something missing and you can never seem to to figure out what it is. It's like you, you've hit your cap. You yeah. can take your art up to like uh, 60%. You know, it's 
it, it's better than a lot of people's, but it's also a lot worse than a lot of other people's. Mm. And you're trying to figure out how you can get there. But in terms of trying to implement your fundamental skills can be quite tricky because we see a lot of people who are in the spot or in the situation where you're actually really good at replicating real life or replicating whatever you're looking at, replicating your reference. But you still haven't covered the fundamentals part. And you might have been able to get away with that for a few years where you're just looking at an animal or you're looking at a person. And when you're sculpting or texturing or drawing them, you're just replicating what you're seeing. You're not replicating what's actually going on under the hood. So it's it's hard to be it's hard to be creative and it's hard to be original. Because but it looks all right. Yeah, what you're it, doing now at this point it looks it looks fine. Yeah. But the problem is you can only yeah, like you only perceive as much as your eyes have been trained to see. And if you don't have that if you don't have the fundamentals behind you, then you only you're only able to replicate what you see, but you might not be seeing everything. Yeah. And you definitely don't understand what's causing what you're seeing, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Particularly when it comes to something like anatomy or shaders or whatever it might be, you you might just be looking at the animal. You might be looking at the elephant, and you can you can do a pretty pretty good one. But if you were to do your own original designs, like it would fall flat immediately. Yeah, replication is one thing, but the moment you're trying to do anything creative, you have to understand fundamentals. Yeah, if you don't understand fundamental anatomy and you're trying to to make a hybrid between an elephant and a moose or whatever it might be, like that, it it, it can't work. Because you need you need to be able to mix and match and blend it together. So one one of the ways we uh, we think about this as well is uh, is when you're doing shading and texturing, it's so easy today to get up to sixty percent. Particularly with you know all the pre-made shaders, it could be just a shader pack or it could be in substance. We have so many smart materials. We've been talking about this in some of our other videos as well, where you can drag and drop a shader and it looks pretty good. It looks it looks yeah, all right, yeah. and. Maybe in some cases it actually looks exactly what you need to. If you have like a glass shader or whatever, maybe drag and drop is fine. Or you have a plastic shader, metal, whatever it might be. So you have some rust and that looks really cool. But you oftentimes get stuck at 60%. Because if you just drag and drop the shader, now you don't understand anything about shading. No. You don't understand how the PBR shader works. You don't understand how the real world works. You just drag and drop and it looks pretty good. Mm. But you have no idea why. So if you uh, if you have a material of only of perfect shaders, maybe you're fine. Or maybe if you're if you're uh, you're only aiming for sixty percent, you might be fine. But the problem is if you want to do something original, like you're doing a, a robot or whatever it might be, and it has a very specific shaders, you you can't just rely on pre-made stuff. And this is where you got to go back to the fundamentals. With the Pokemon battle, right now you're trying to just use bite on something, <laughs> or hydro pump or something. You're just straight up brute forcing your way out of it without looking at, without having an elegant approach to yeah. it. A more elegant approach to, to, to texturing, for instance, it is not waiting for a better version of substance to come out with more shaders or to buy another shader pack. The more elegant version here is to understand not even how the shader works, but just how light works in real life. If you're looking at something and uh, and not just don't just try to figure out what is a bump map, what is what can be sold with speckled roughness or whatnot, but but understand how the material itself works more on like um on like a molecular level. Why is something more shiny than something else? Why is mirror why is that perfectly reflective while something like a couch? <laughs> why can't you why can't you look at yourself in a why couch? Can't the couch just be a mirror? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it's, it sounds like a stupid example, but like, well, there is clearly a fundamental difference yeah. in, in those two materials. And you gotta understand why. What I used to do when I was doing skin shading was the non-elegant way. That was throwing hydro pump at Charizard, but being overpowered. So <laughs> and it kind of works. What I would do is I would look at, uh, I would Google skin shader materials in in whatever software I was using, and would just replicate the values there without understanding it. It looked really good in in the examples I was looking at, but mine they never really they never really worked because skin shading is not about specific numbers in a shader. It's about a deeper understanding of how skin works, how yeah. blemishes bump, and and basically how how a human works. And the artists I was looking at, they, they had all the fundamentals down. They understood all of that. Well, I was just replicating the final level of the shader. Yeah, here are your settings. Put those settings in. Yeah. Skin shader. Yeah, boom. And it worked for them. It didn't work for me. 
Yeah, and the problem is then you can't troubleshoot it. No, it's no, kind of no. like <laughs> uh, more Pokemon analogies. Mm. If you like, so like let's them. say you're level. Th- okay, so how does it work? It works in Pokemon, right? So with gyms, right? Mm. So you can only control Pokemon up to a certain level based yeah. on how many gyms you've beaten. So let's say you can control Pokemon up to level thirty because you've beaten like two gyms or three yeah. gyms or whatever. Uh, all of a sudden you find a Mewtwo or a Charizard or something that's level 70, and you can't control them yet. Mm. But, um, th- so this is equivalent to your shading. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> we have a plan here. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> well, maybe. Um, Let's see so, what it takes us. <laughs> so there you, know, you You throw out the Pokeball, and you have your, your Mewtwo battle for you, and your Mewtwo is level 70. I know Mewtwo is not level 70 in Pokemon, but whatever. Um, but it doesn't always do what you tell it to. Mm. Like sometimes, sometimes it'll use Psychic. Sometimes it'll just uh, go to sleep or mm. hurt itself. <laughs> you know, you, you can never really know. And it's the same thing when using power that you're not able to wield yet. <laughs> you know, the same thing with Substance, for example. Yeah. If you're just using Smart Materials, that's like you being a Pokemon trainer at uh, that can control Pokemon up to level 30. Mm. You don't understand why you're using the Smart Materials. And sometimes... They do what you want them to, but sometimes they don't. Mm-hmm. And if they don't want do what you want them to, you don't know how to fix them or how to correct them yet yeah. because you don't know anything about the, the shading workflow yet. Yeah. So you're missing that fundamental connection to how to build your own shaders. And we're seeing that a lot in terms of, you know, when people are posting uh, online, especially like sort of more game assets that are done in Substance, is they all look very generic. Yeah. Like the, the shading for most of you guys' assets are generic as fuck mm. it's basically basically it's like okay here's my gun and i put on the gun metal shader yeah uh and then uh, i have some you know just some some few a few scratches on the corners because that's where scratches always accumulate on all corners on all on all corners there's not variation in it and it's like black gun metal here and then like black plastic there and a gray metal shader yeah. there and that's it yeah. like there, there's really you're missing the story yeah. That's behind the shading. Like I, I saw that with some military stuff that was posted somewhere as well, where it was just like default green uh, military uh, metal shader, and there was like, this is like a World War One artifact kind of thing you've created, and you're you've just you've just painted it green. Yeah. You know, you're you're missing the story behind, it, and you're missing. So not only are you missing the fundamentals of understanding how the shading and the texturing works, but also sort of. The, the backstory, and I think that's a really important and underrated part in, in most cases, whether you're doing, if you, let's say you're doing a face sculpt, uh, you can do, yeah, you can do perfect face, but you pay for perfect faces usually are less interesting just because there's less story behind it. Yeah. Um, obviously, you have those model faces that are just perfect and, you know, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> um, but having that, just trying to think about what has come before, what has happened up until the point where you've created this asset, because few things that are made in 3D are supposed to be perfect. You know, they're not in the real world. It's very rare. You find stuff that looks perfect, maybe like an Apple product, but they're also, you know, it'd be pretty boring to shade an Apple product. Yeah. Here's just a gray metal shader, that's it. Then you could totally use a substance material. And even if you do have something like a perfect model face, you have one of those Victoria's Secret faces. And if you were to do that, you, yeah, sure, the proportions are pretty, pretty, pretty good. But you can just, what is the person thinking? Mm. It doesn't have to. And also with the whole story thing, we're not saying that you have to make this sad sob story or whatever. It's, it just means, what is the history of the item? Yeah. Is if you're doing, if you, let's say you're doing, you're doing a gun and the gun is five years old. Maybe it doesn't have to be that, oh, I was implicated in this nasty murder. It can just be, it, it's been fired a lot. Yeah. And where then do you do you get the heat signatures for it? Where Where's people been holding it? Do you get sweat certain places? Is has, maybe it's been out, is there some rust, whatever. Mm. And and you just got to think about where the item has been. Because cause otherwise it just becomes so generic. And this is the kind of stuff you can't just do with smart materials. And we're not hating on smart materials. We we, we no, love no, we no. love Painter and all that. It's it's such a good tool. But it's more that if if you have something which has been used in a very specific way, uh, like a bayonet or whatever, it you know it's, it's gonna or a knife, whatever it might be, it's just gonna be faded in different areas. It's gonna be dulled in certain areas. Mm. And you gotta really think about this. And I think this is a huge error when when it comes to, or it's not even an error. It's just. It, it's just not entirely there yet. No. When uh, if you're an if you're an artist at that level thirty. Like Pokemon. um, I have a I have a personal story regarding that. I um, when I first started out doing doing two D, 
I, you know, I would just look around for concept artists and I'm sort of, I would try to replicate them because like there is nothing wrong with just trying to replicate because that means uh, you're trying to just, if you see, okay, this is how this person draws uh, line art like this, I'll try to replicate his kind of line art. You know, you don't need to go deep with that. It's like, okay, no. how do I hold the pen and that kind of shit? That, that, that doesn't matter. But I was trying, I was, I was starting out with concept art and I was looking a lot at Richard, Richard Anderson, I think. He's a concept artist. He was a concept artist for Guild Wars 2 at the time. I think he's at Rockstar or something now. A really, really good artist. And he had this tutorial where you would draw, it was like the a horseman in a forest or something. Really cool tutorial. And I, you know, I learned a lot. So the tutorial just goes and I try to replicate it. I use his techniques, his technical skills that he had in Photoshop. I would technically do exactly the same things that he would do. And I did this tutorial multiple times and I, the painting got better every time. So I learned something new every time, but it was, you know, through repetition. So I just kept doing it and doing it uh, because I knew that I would pick up on, on different things. And at one point, I, I showed this piece to um, someone at the at a school and they're in you know, this feedback session and he looks at the piece and he goes, oh yeah, you know, really cool composition in this piece. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> and I, I went home and I started thinking about it, like, what what the fuck is comp- <laughs> com- composition? <laughs> I was like, I didn't, I honestly didn't have, I didn't have any ideas or I looked up composition on, mm-hmm. on Google and I was like, oh, rule of thirds and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, okay, Google rule of thirds. And okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it has good composition, but I didn't understand all the things because you can't just you can't just be like, um, okay, I will make good composition now. No, because no. good composition comes from so many things. What I what I thought I understand about composition was okay, the writer is on the top right of the screen. He perfect, uh, you know, rule of third grid and all that kind of stuff. I was like, no, you've completely misunderstood the point. This was a, it was because the picture was really well balanced in terms of lighting, color, mm. uh, focus, contrast, shape, all of these things made up composition, but I, I had no idea what he was talking about because I didn't have the fundamentals. I just started replicating a painting, um, which, you know, I, like I said, I learned a lot from it, but my paintings started getting better. Like at that point, I could only replicate. I couldn't make something up from my mind mm. because I didn't I didn't understand what good composition was. So maybe technically, I could make some cool colors, I could make good lighting, but you know, my composition was was trash because I fundamentally didn't understand it yet. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. I, I had the same thing with composition. It was always rule of thirds. Yeah. Exactly. And then we went to school and, and Morten and I went to the same uh, same school and we had the same art classes and we had when we had our teacher Lawrence, he explained what composition actually was. He didn't even talk about r- rule of thirds. And you who after, cares? Who cares? It's just that's <laughs> one tool you can use, but it was all about light balancing and and values and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I think that's that's one of the things that I remember most clearly from like trying to uh, trying to replicate and trying to understand uh, people's thought process when they're when they were painting. Um, and when my friend said to me, "Oh, you have a good composition," I just remember going home and thinking like. What is he talking about? <laughs> like, what is composition? Yeah. You know, there was like this tree lock that was sort of subtly pointing towards the the rider as well. You know, there's just so many smart things in that picture, yeah. and I think you know, improving your your art fundamentals in general. Looking at some really good concept artists is also a a really good way to do that. Try to analyze what they've done because a lot of the really good concept artists they are excellent storytellers and they're excellent at at conveying emotion and conveying, you know, the feeling that they want in a very sort of rough way. They you really, know. really are. You know, their, their concept their concept art can oftentimes be super rough, but you still, if it's a good concept artist, you still get the point across. Mm. And that speaks to, you know, their fundamental skills. It doesn't matter. It's like we've, we've talked about a lot when people ask, like, okay, give me a list of all the magical brushes you use in ZBrush. And like I use like four yeah. or three. I don't know. Usually when I sculpt, I use like two, maybe like with one added in here yeah, and there. Yeah, if I only had one, I could, I could use one. Yeah, exactly. And so it doesn't even matter which one, I can use any one. <laughs> yeah. Blob brush, yeah. bring it on. Yeah, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the same thing, you know, I think we've talked about this before. Uh, we're like, oh, which pencil do you use? Mm. I was super obsessed with that in the beginning. Me too. I remember uh, watching some... Uh, like comic book art illustration tutorials on normal workshop by 
Oh, I can't remember his name. It's like a bold guy. Well, I think I know what you mean. It's it's super good. Yeah, yeah. He's a bold guy. He does uh, he does comics, and he's like super amazing drafts draftsman. Mm. And uh, I completely misunderstood the point of the videos because I was like, okay, which uh, which mechanical pencil specifically <laughs> yeah. does he use? <laughs> what kind of paper is he using? What what is it? A razor he's using? You know, all this like ridiculous bullshit that doesn't make you a better artist. Mm. Um, it might speed up. Your workflow a little bit and that was something we talked about it was like if your technical skills not that you know using the same pencil as this dude is using will up your technical skills but if it's software related your technical skills just help you get to your result faster but if you can still only get to 60 percent then maybe you get to 60 percent in half the time yeah um which you know okay you know that's also useful because then you can do more and more um you can do more and more studies. You can do more and more models. So you can you, know, you you can you can cram in more sort of study time, if you will. But it is it is the fundamentals that's going to help you improve the most. Yeah, when we were prepping for this video, I was I was thinking about different things you could improve as an artist, and and definitely like improving. You know, if you can if you can get to the same result twice as fast, it means you can do twice many twice as much work, which means you can do more of the pidgey grinding in the grass. Yeah. But ultimately, you the technical part is not as important because also this level level 30 pokemon you know you might be i've been doing this for a few years maybe you have three four years experience maybe even working professionally mm -hmm. you know the tools the, the problem here isn't your speed it's not if you no. were to learn 30 more maya hotkeys or customize your zebra's interface that's not the problem i've <laughs> never had the issue where i feedback someone's model and be like yeah it's a pretty good model but uh, have you thought about customizing your interface like that's just <laughs> no. that's not the point of it uh, I've had a lot of people, particularly students, ask me, why do you do so many tutorials? Like, aren't you afraid of people would steal your skills? Like, steal Ooh. what skills? <laughs> do some videos on how to UV map a character. Yeah, cool. Uh, that's a technical thing. Yeah. What what separates what separates somebody with more experience than somebody somebody who's more beginner is not if you know how what tool to use. If you use the symmetrize tool in Maya or whatnot, it's it's do you understand how the overall process works. Do you understand anatomy to a deeper level? Do you, when you're doing, if, let's say you're faster at UV mapping, that just means you can now you can do texturing faster. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you can do texturing faster if you're still only using smart materials and you don't understand how anything actually works, how light behaves. So, no, I'm not at all afraid that people will steal our techniques. It's more, you know, you just gotta share it. I think uh, an interesting one I just thought of is um, <laughs> someone on our Discord linked this a while ago it was a it was a live stream of um uh, what's his name uh, the dude who always does sexy women hazardous art or something hazardous or something like the dude from news who's in new zealand or something oh yeah uh, john troy nickel that's the know? that's the guy and um someone linked like a video of him where they asked him okay what do you what do you think about a uh, marvelous designer and he was like Ugh. Marvelous design is for pussies. <laughs> and, you know, people were like, oh, sick burn. And yeah. like, oh, Flip Normals, they do a lot of Marvelous Designer stuff. And it's like, no, it's true. It is for pussies. <laughs> and, and, like, let me try to explain this. Because um, if, you're, if you're sculpting... So, like, if you, if you only know uh, Marvelous Designer, right? And Marvelous Designer is an amazing tool. And I use it a lot. And I love it. But it's easy. Mm. Like, Marvelous Designer is easy. Like, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to think. You just have to drag and drop, and then you have to know some stuff about um, fabrics. That's about it. But if you have to sculpt fabrics yourself, that's a whole different yeah, level. Not of, even comparable. Like, sculpting cloth and sculpting fabric, realistically, mind you, is one of the hardest things you can do. Because it's it's such a chaotic, organic... There, there are rules. There are clear rules. I think there's, like, three or four different kinds of folds that you can have and that's it fabric doesn't do anything more than that um but anyone who's doing marvelous designer i would definitely still recommend them to just try to sculpt something because yeah. then you understand why do the folds behave like this and then maybe you can when you're doing marvelous design you can start to direct it a little bit more you can and say like you yeah. want folds and wrinkles here um, because I think this would look better. It might not always correspond with what is as realistic as possible, but I think artistically, this would convey what I want in the fabric better. Yeah, and we have a tutorial on this as well, which uses Marvel Sun and Seabrush together. Yeah, yeah. And Marvel Sun is just one part of it. 
And then once you once you your marvelous designer stuff is done, you take it into ZBrush and you sculpt more in it. But you can only do that if you understand the fundamentals. Yeah. I saw a piece the other day which uh, it was about cloth, and I was like, maybe you should instead of sculpting, you should use marvelous designer on it. And and he was like, but I did, and then I sculpted it afterwards. But now it just looked like a sculpt because uh, he didn't know the fundamentals of sculpting. So he he broke it afterwards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it looked really good from from marvelous, but but then. If you don't know the fundamentals, then you know you only will get to sixty percent. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think. There's got to be like some fundamental stuff you can do with particles as well. I don't know what that would be, <laughs> like Simit and Houdini. But you yeah, know, maybe know. it's like you could have like maybe it's physics. Yeah, your you understand well, your understanding of color theory mm. maybe helps, and like you know. But I th- I think that the artistic fundamental skills help you in in whatever field it yeah, is you're doing within art because. Even let's say let's say it's it's just uh you're doing uh, you're simming particles and it's uh, like dust you know every time a foot lands you know there's there's some ways you can art direct that yourself yeah. like if it's just like okay, generic this is how the volume works poof, it's it's blown out but if you can direct somehow like okay I'll just add a wind thing here to blow it a little bit like that add some turbulence just to to just make it a little more visually interesting I think there's so many ways artistically you can you know up your game by by complementing your skills with fundamentals and this is it's not that you activate the fundamentals no, no. It. it's just it's just always there if, if you're doing some kind of houdini dust sim you wouldn't be like oh okay i gotta remember my art fundamentals no you just you just know them mm. it's, it's kind of like body fundamentals you, you just know how to walk you don't have to think <laughs> about that so it's just a constant skill you always have. And that's why I, we recommended that you watch the observation video first or yeah. afterwards, whatever you prefer, because that is really like the true, that is really the true separation. Yeah. And it's, it's not hotkeys. Like five, five, I think like five or six years ago, I, I decided that I wanted to be better at faces mm. and I wanted to understand expressions better. And I wanted to be better at, you know, coming up with faces myself. So what I did was I sat down with some Philippe Fro videos, and he's amazing. I if love you're, Philippe Fro. If you're into uh, face sculpting, you should check out his videos for sure. And I just started doing what he was doing. Mind you, I had a I had a grasp on the fundamentals already, not uh, you know of, of anatomy and of the face, yes, but not to the same extent that he does, obviously. And his know. stuff is traditional clay. Yeah. and you were doing seafresh. He's he's a he's a god, mm. you know. So, it, but it was still. At that point, I was trying to replicate, but with a fundamental understanding, and that meant that my progression was really quick, and I, I could see improvement from each sculpt, like from one sculpt to the next, because because I was at that point where okay, you know, I got a solid grasp. I'm not the best artist out there, but I think I know what I'm doing, and then I just added I just added repetition to to sort of like you know my everyday. And I sculpted a face every day. It was a quick sculpt, maybe some expression in there. It was kids, it was women, it was men, it was everything, different kind of races, you know, whatever it was. I just tried everything just to up my sort of like, just up my skills when it came to faces. And I think that, that that's something that still stuck with me. Obviously, if you don't do that for a long time, you start to forget some things, you get into it again, you know, those things start to come back to you. But, but even if you start forgetting some things, you still have the fundamental observation. Yeah, yeah. Because that's that's specifically we talk about that in the observation video we just did, where you you aren't able to perceive it. So you can even sculpt the same face over and over and over again. Yeah. And you would still observe new things. So yeah, you, yeah, you definitely your skills will definitely decay. But uh, once once you once you've been there before, it's a lot hard. It's a lot easier to to return back to it. That's why I think that's why you know people always say, "Oh, it's always uh, faster the second time." Yeah, it is, but also shut the fuck up <laughs> uh, because you know when you're in a production and Maya just crashed. I remember we had that one time. I was working at I was working at a frame store, I think, and we had this production, whatever production people do Person. and uh she just uh, she was in the room and she was very hr like mm-hmm. you know like they are and a friend of mine he had been working in maya and all of a sudden maya crashes and you know it's been like i think four hours since she saved oh. and he went like fuck <laughs> um and she just she was she was uh, you know no offense very american <laughs> and she just turns around he's like excuse me <laughs> <laughs> and all of us were just like Oh, you shut up now. You just you don't know the pain. Like I don't care how much love you put into your spreadsheet. No. You don't know the pain of doing cables for four hours, having it crash, and just go like 
I need to redo this. <laughs> I need some air, and I just need to let out a just a big burst of just violent words. <laughs> and like everyone just turned around to her, and be like, "No, no, don't just uh, you, you leave the room yeah. now." You know, he needs some he needs some space now. This is some ang- this is an anger so now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and there are certain cases you know where doing it the same. I mean, and even doing those cables four hours afterwards. Yeah, he's gonna be now. It's only gonna take him like. Two and a half or three hours. <laughs> that still sucks. Three hours and 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now you don't have to think so much about the creative process. Now, it, yeah. well, creative process, laying out cable, I don't know. But like um, set dressing, let's yeah. call it set dressing. Uh, you don't have to think about that so much anymore. Yeah. Now it's just the uh, boring uh, labor part of laying them out. It's the same thing. Let's say you're uh, doing a painting, a traditional painting, and uh, someone... Uh, oil paint someone sprays the thing on that makes all your oils go like blah, 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 blah. and then now they're all in the floor yeah you know you're probably going to be not i wouldn't say twice as fast you're definitely going to be faster the second time around but you're not gonna you're not gonna have fun doing it no so i i understand and i agree sort of like to an extent the validity of saying okay it's always faster the second time around but because also it shut is. up but also <laughs> shut up because it's not fun <laughs> it's like being uh, well no, I haven't been stabbed but I assume that's what like being stabbed is like I haven't in your heart I once I, w- I once almost like saw my finger off oh like, yeah finger off. you so shouldn't do that I, f- I think that's kind of like being pro- stabbed probably like that it's yeah. like being stabbed with a saw yeah yeah is that what losing four hours of work is like? Yeah, totally. I, I, I think it is. That was horrible because, like, uh, The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker was coming out three weeks after that. Oh, no. And I was so sad because, like, you know, it was my uh, my index finger. So you need that for tr- oh. the trigger buttons on the GameCube controller. Oh, man, I had to relearn how to... Uh, yeah, it was a nightmare. <laughs> so speaking of art... <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. All right. Yeah, so one thing as well where at this level is... Well, you know, you're level 30 Pokemon. You've been doing this for some, some time. Like, you're doing this for a few, few years. You have You probably have a network now. You know, you know network people. Network of Pokemon trainers. <laughs> network of Pokemon trainers. <laughs> but the problem is your network and your friends. Maybe if you're in uni, you know, you they might be at the same level as you are. This is where it's critical that you find somebody better than you. If you just keep getting advice from people who are at the same level, then you know you're gonna keep doing what you've always been doing. Or in, in worst case, people that aren't at your level. Mm, you know. Yeah. That 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 also happens. Yeah, you can get wrong feedback. Yeah, uh, or you can get validation that what you're doing is totally awesome when it's not, or maybe maybe the work is fine, and they're like, yeah, it's okay, but uh, but you need better than okay. Yeah, this this might come off as super arrogant, but you know whatever. Uh, I had a friend who um, I have a friend who went, I went to the same school with, and I remember we talked about this in terms of um, skills. He's a concept artist, fantastic concept artist. And, I mean, by far, he was the best in his class. There was, like, no dispute about that. And I remember we sat down at one point talking about skills, and he'd been working professionally for, like, three or four years before he actually came to the school. And uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't amazing for him because his artistic level was so high that for three years he only surrounded himself with people who were worse than him. Mm. Like, he, there was legit no one, not even close. There was not even someone who was close to his level. So in the environment of trying to improve, he, he didn't find any competition. He didn't find anyone who could sort of inspire him to be better. And so he didn't really feel like he progressed there. Like, he had to go way out and only, like, like find people online and, like, that kind of stuff to try and improve because the environment that he was in didn't allow him to sort of, like... Because it's nice with that competition when you have multiple people around you that you can compete with and you can, you know, share notes. But the problem is the notes that they shared with him was like, yeah, I figured this stuff out like 10 years ago. Yep. So it, it's kind of like we, we had a video where we were talking about languages, what a guy called Matt from Matt versus Japan. And it's it's kind of like, let's say you were to learn language, but you're already almost fluent in language. <laughs> you, you're having an English class and all the other people are beginners and you're not. Yeah. Like that is... You can't learn anything from that. No. So definitely surround yourself with people who are better. Than you. I mean, in terms of social stuff, you could totally still have your friends. I'm not saying that. Yeah, but yeah. I've seen this a lot going around to unis that you have two or three people in class who are just, they're like five years ahead of everyone else. Like there is there is just no competition. Yeah. And if you are one of those people, you, you really just have to get out of that com- community in terms of feedback. You can't trust them. Even, even we might get hate from this for certain people, but even your teachers... We, uh, we might you might have <laughs> teachers who they, they are just not at your level yeah I mean you know don't want to get into that whole thing again but 
Teachers at universities. <sighs> Some of them you can totally trust. 100%. But other people as well. You, you just got to know if you're able to trust you them. You just have them. to be critical. Yeah. Don't trust them because they are uh, they have authority. No. Uh, but trust them because they actually have good skills. Yeah. So it's not about finding... It's not necessarily even about finding a senior artist at Blizzard to give you feedback. It's about finding somebody with that skill set to give you feedback. Yeah. Somebody who you can trust to critically evaluate you. It's like what they say in the movie with Plash that there aren't that there are no two words more harmful in the English language than good job. <laughs> which is, you know, it's a bit controversial because but it's like if you say that if you just say, Hey, awesome, awesome job, then they're just thinking, Alright, cool. I did do a really cool job. But if they're being like, the hell is this? Yeah. You gotta fundamentally rethink your approach. At least <laughs> you know, like <laughs> At least you learn something. At least you learn something. I've done that to students as well, which it always hurts to do it. Yeah. Because it what you want to do, you want to you just want to tell people this is awesome. Keep doing exactly what you're doing. Give them a little hint, here, hint there and there. Mm. But sometimes you just they just have to rethink their approach. There yeah. is just no other way, at least if you want to be a good teacher. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a hard part. And I think, I think a lot of the the issue with a lot of teachers is that I mean, first of all, they might have had experience ten years ago. They don't anymore, yeah. and they think that they that those skills are still valid even though they haven't maintained them. Uh, maybe they were in a different department that has nothing to do with what you're currently doing. Yeah. and But you still have to guide the students. And, you know, I get that that's hard. It's Of course it's hard, but I think a lot of people who go to school, of course, are still in a, they have the mindset that, you know, you go to school, you trust the authority because that's how it's been for like the last 200 years or whatever. Yeah. You know, the teacher always knows best, yeah. but that's not always the case. So definitely, you know, be wary of that. Listen to your teachers, but also just keep in mind that what they say might not always be the most optimal. Yeah. So, so generally, this video here can be summed up into you gotta you gotta get back to fundamentals. Mm. You gotta understand the fundamentals. You know, if it's texturing, you gotta learn learn how light operates in the real world. If it's anatomy or character sculpting, you gotta understand how anatomy and body mechanics and all that kind of stuff works. Yeah. And then you just gotta do the grind. It's the Pidgey grind. Yeah, it's the, you go into Pidgey, you, Professor Oak just gave you your Bulbasaur and he's like, <laughs> here you go, out in the grass and I'll see you in two years. Yeah. You know, it's, it is what it is. And then you got to be elegant as well because, you know, you, it's one of these, you can't just be, uh, you can't just take your Pidgey against the Charizard. You got to, you got to <laughs> use the correct tools for the right job. You got to, yeah. you got to do more than just straight up brute forcing it, even though there is, of course, a part of that as well. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Like, you know, for example, I... I might not be like the most hard shot, hard surface modeler in the world, but I still have a good grasp on, you know, just in terms of just design and modeling. Yeah. So even though I don't know every single tool in ZBrush to do the crazy organic sci-fi kind of hard surface, that doesn't mean that I can't do it. No. It's just, that's where my technical skills in ZBrush, for example, aren't at the level of someone who's only doing hard surface. No. But in terms of the artistic skills, I would be able to reproduce that. So yeah. that's like, it's, yeah, you might not be able to get there as fast if you're lacking some of the technical skills. But with the artistic skills and the fundamentals, you can always get there, yeah. at least in my opinion. So I think that about covers it for this video. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed our uh, Pokemon analogies oh. and that they actually made sense. <laughs> Maybe next time we'll just do a review of the new Pokemon game yeah, or something. We can do that Yeah, on the so. Switch. <laughs> yeah. We're just going to be playing a lot of Switch. <laughs> <laughs> no tutorials for some time. <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching and if you want to see more content like this in the future, make sure to like, comment and subscribe. Thanks guys.